Coming up on this episode of One on One Sports. We dive into the NBA GM pool. Look at possible trades for Le'Veon Bell. Discuss a big ups upset in the FCS. All that and so much more. And it all starts right now. Welcome to this episode of One on One Sports. I'm Andrew Vindelis. And I'm Matt Holza. We are excited to be with you today. And to kick things off, Andrew and I can take a swing at the quick hitters. The NBA recently told Cowboys shooting guard J.R. Smith that he would have to cover up his supreme calf tattoo every game or be fined. Andrew, the NBA has been at the forefront of letting players express themselves. Is this a step backward or is this J.R. Smith's fault? I think it's really dumb that the NBA is going to fine him every game he wears it. And they'll have to give him like a lifetime fine. But at the same time, I think J.R. should know better than to freely advertise on his body. It's a typical J.R. Smith move. I mean, you know, clearly not thinking with his head. And while I think it's dumb that the NBA is le isn't letting this slide in particular, it's, it's free advertisement. Yeah, first of all, just Supreme Tattoo, why? Why did he do that? It's, it's why? Dumb. But this is so hypocritical of the NBA. He is not the first player to have a commercial logo tattooed on him, and they have made the, anyone else cover them in the past. Kyrie Irving has the Friends logo on his forearm. Kamar Anthony has the Warner Brothers logo on his shoulder. So why is J.R. Smith being the, the scapegoat? Why is he being picked on and not Then Kyrie give everyone Irving else fines, I guess. But at the same time, like, but they won't, they won't do, do that. You don't think J.R. knew that other players were also... I'm sure he did. That's why, that's why he's so upset like about that? this. I'm sure he did. Either way, it's just, I don't think he's thinking with his head. I don't think it's very smart of him to do that. But at the same time, the NBA does need to kind of, you know, not be as hypocritical. But at the same time, JR needs to not be so boneheaded. Everyone's wrong about this. Exactly. Vancouver Canucks made a big splash in the sports world when they announced that the team is banning Fortnite for the upcoming season. Many of the league have come out against the ban, the ban saying that this team is looking for a scapegoat. Matt, what do you make of this? I like it, and here's why. So the ban is just for road trips, right? So road trips, what are they for? They're for playing road games, bonding with the team, team dinners, team you films. You don't think sessions. Fortnite is team bonding? Yeah, but it's not hockey related. That's the problem. You're oh, not focusing okay. on the game at hand. You're not, and honestly, there's the center, Bo, Ho Bo Horvat said, look, this is fine. We need to focus on team bonding. I like it. Really? I mean, let the guys have fun, dude. Come on. I mean, there's no really, there hasn't really been any public backlash about, you know, Fortnite distracting pro players save until it now. Home. Save it for home. What do you mean save it for home? What are they going to do on the road? they got to find ways to well, I just said you they're know, watch film occupy and themselves. With the team. I mean, th that's not the only thing you have to do. There's other times that you have where you're, you have your downtime. It's a so addict. It is a very addictive way to spend your time. But I think it's a good way to make their team teammates bond and have fun at the if same time. If they need another reason, in May, the $30 million a year Red Sox star David Price, he missed a start due to carpal tunnel. Unconfirmed that was because of Fortnite. It is not because of was. Fortnite. But let, lest we forget the fantastic video of Alex Ovechkin getting his first win on Fortnite. How can they take that away? I just don't get it. It's, it's fun. You know, no fun league. They're getting too many tips from it's the NFL. Fine. Stan Van Gundy came out and openly said that LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan on Get Up with Jalen Rose. This, Andrew, this debate has been going on for so long. Let's put an end to it right now. You got to start a team, LeBron or Jordan, who would you rather have? Now, this isn't a conversation about who is the greatest of all no, time, exactly. as we mentioned. It's about who would you want on your team. And LeBron, based on the sole reason that, based on a sample size, you can put him with anyone, anywhere, and he'll win you a championship. I'm sure it's a little bit different now that he's in the West for the first time and you have the Golden State Warriors on your league, but LeBron made it to the finals last year pretty much by himself, and if I get to, you know, be the GM here, I get to pick the team, it's going to be LeBron all the way. I just look at who LeBron has taken to the playoffs, the likes of Sasha Pavlovic, Larry Hughes, Delonte West, you know, just so many guys who shouldn't have made the playoffs, and I get that Jordan, I'm not saying Jordan's not the GOAT, he is, give me Jordan with five seconds on the Agreed. clock. But you want to start a team, he makes players around him better, does LeBron. And that's why LeBron is the person to start a team. Exactly. With. LeBron, like, if anything, this debate, LeBron is, the, without a doubt, the most dominant player in the league today, if yeah. not all time. And as you said, he makes people better. I mean, obviously, the Cavs team last year shouldn't have made the finals. They shouldn't have even won a game in that, and they didn't. But even last year in 2017, they shouldn't have gone 4 and 1. But that was because of LeBron and because he elevates the teammates. Nobody thought of Kevin Love as a truly star player until he got to the Cavs and played with LeBron. And in LA, I'm sure he's going to do the exact same thing. So if you're starting a team and you need one person between, 
LeBron and Jordan. It's LeBron. I just feel like, and not to say Jordan's not this, but LeBron is such a good team leader. He can build young guys up. He can bring veterans back from the dead. You know, you see, we've seen him do it with James Jones and the likes of veteran guys yeah. who follow him because they know playing with him will give them extremely great benefits for their career they wouldn't have other places. And I know the biggest knock against LeBron is his finals record. The stats between LeBron and Jordan in the finals are not that indifferent. No. They're, they're, they're different. Right? They're so similar except for points because LeBron's more facilitated And who's to Jordan. say that Jordan wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been as successful or as dominant if he didn't have Pittman, Pippen, Robin, etc. Exactly. on his team. And that's not to say that Jordan isn't the greatest of all time, as you know. We both think that. But LeBron is the best team starter option in this league. Yeah, and he's going to make the Lakers better, obviously. He's not Kobe. He's not trying to take over for Kobe, but LeBron's going to make this team better. I'm, I'm glad the Lakers have someone to lead them forward, not just a young player. Very excited to see what LeBron does in L.A. Exactly. Baltimore Ravens defensive coordinator Don Martindale said that Brown's quarterback, Baker Mayfield, is this generation's Brett Favre or John Elway. Matt, is it too early to be saying this about a quarterback who's only made one start in his career? Yes, this is absurd. This is ridiculous. He's made one start, and yes, he has won. He's, he's now 1-1, one and one and he only had the tough loss to the Raiders. I know he beat your Ravens. I'm sorry. I know. But it's sad. He, he could be 2-0. and oh. The Raiders loss to the Raiders was close, and you can blame a couple of things for that. But he's a very good player. He's shown a lot of promise. He's, he's shown leadership in the locker room. He's shown accuracy down the field. He's mobile. We knew that already. But he's only played two full games. You can't come out and say this just yet. And he looked good against the Ravens, obviously, other than this. The Jets was his only other win. The first two wins Cleveland has had in two years nearly, but he still threw some ducks, was pressured, and 342 yards against the number one defense is only as good as, you know, how, many, how much productivity you score. Only one touchdown, zero in the first half, threw an interception as well. He's showing flashes of potential. Obviously, his cannon arm, his, you know, headstrong attitude, and his ability to be mobile when he needs to, but if anyone's closer to Brett Favre in this league, it's Patrick Mahomes, I think. I, yeah, I agree with that. Going back to Bicker, do you think that Martin will just said this to get in his head before the Ravens-Browns game? Was it a strategic move? I, I don't think so because I think it was more of a respect move. You know, the Ravens were are one of the most dominant defenses in the league right now, and Baker put up a great fight against them, as we mentioned, over 300 yards passing, yeah. passing. Led them to a go-ahead pass to a rookie wide receiver nobody ever heard of. I can't even remember his name <laughs> right now. But he set them up for that winning field goal, and I think this was a move out of respect because Baker does have potential, and they chose him yeah. for number one overall for a reason. Even Hugh Jackson said he's just trying to butter us up before the game. You know, don't read into it. I think it is respect, but I also think it's kind of just empty words. Are you going to take Hugh Jackson's word for that, though, really? I mean, Don hey, Martin they Dale? won, so yeah, you know, Browns knows? have the edge on that one. Either way, Baker, I think he's a great choice for this team. He's starting to make me believe in his ability to lead the Browns forward more and more, and I think it's a very bright future. Maybe he'll finally be the last name on that very long jersey of Browns starters. That's all the time we have for the quick hitters. Up next, I'll be joined at the desk to offer our reaction to our NBA GM poll. Every year, the media conducts a survey among NBA general managers that asks them all about the upcoming season. Some of these polls include who will win MVP, the NBA championship, and so much more. Josh, let's look at who, what they said, and let's see what we think. So first of all, GM said Luka Doncic is going to win Rookie of the Year. Do you agree with that? No, i got to say Wendell Carter Jr. Dude is voted uh, most likely to succeed as a rookie by his peers. He's got very good stats, 7 points per game in the preseason. He's also... Just a over all around really good player for his position. He's one of the best big men entering the league, and I gotta say, Bulls look promising this year, at least in the at least in defense. The Bulls have a lot of young players, and also mm -hmm. that was one of the more popular draft picks of Wendell mm -hmm. Carter. So let's go from rookie of the year to most surprising offense move. GM said it was Boogie Cousins to the Warriors. Do you agree with that? I mean, absolutely. I mean, here's a, here's a guy who had a chance to build something in New Orleans, had something to build in Sacramento, and now he's like under the radar in Sacramento. I mean, in uh, Golden State. He is a he, Boogie Cousins is a superstar. That's what he is. And unfortunately, nothing's gonna work out in Sacramento. They didn't work out in New Orleans, and now he's in Golden State. And I don't think this was a good move for him. I'm not sure he'll be able to like shine his, or maybe he doesn't want to. Is shine. he ring chasing like KD? Is he, he might, ring he might be ring chasing. Honestly, I think he's fed up with being on teams that just kind of float either at the bottom or in the middle. So who knows? I think it are definitely you, is a shocking move. Are you surprised? Because remember there were reports that you know he just mm -hmm. wanted a certain amount of money. There were teams who wouldn't even offer him anything, and he ended up in the Warriors. Are you surprised he couldn't get an offer for any, from anyone else? He's a dynamic center, but he's also got attitude issues. He's not a real team player, all things considered. So I'm not surprised. 
I'm not surprised that no one offered him. I'm just surprised he went to the Warriors out of every team in the league. Yeah, the, the last thing they need is more weapons. All right, so we're going to mm -hmm. stay with the offseason moves. Most underrated offseason move was Tyreek Evans. Do you agree with that, or do you think it's someone else? Well, going back to the Bulls, Jabari Parker is a very interesting big player for them, like power forward. Um, very young player coming right out, of, coming right back into the Bulls. And honestly, him and Wendell Carter could team up and make some pretty interesting moves this year. So Tyreek Evans is a great player, very dynamic, but... Jabari Parker and Wendell Carter Jr. could be a very, very interesting duo to watch. And I think he is underrated, at least in my eyes, as a rookie last year and as a player this year. So we'll He's got to stay healthy, though. We know that the Bulls have a lot of good, good young players. Mm -hmm. Parker, Mark, and you look at guys like Chris Dunn, Zach Levine, who are really good players with these offseason moves that the Bulls made. Are they a contender now, in the East at least? The East has been considerably weakened now that LeBron's gone. I still think it's a Celtics conference, and the Sixers are still primed to you know, compete with them as well. But the Bulls could make some moves this year. They could make the playoffs, you they think? Could they could absolutely make the playoffs. I don't know how deep they'd go, but this is a young team that I would definitely keep my eye on. Right, Chicago certainly will benefit from the kind of very weak East. Josh, mm -hmm. thank you for that NBA talk. Appreciate it. That's all the time we have left. When we come back, we'll be taking a trip to the Gridiron to discuss one of the NFL's biggest stories of the year. You didn't give up on sex. Don't give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Find yours at bedsider.org. Hey! So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right, I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay, so who's gonna do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect, that's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs, just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover keytar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff. Create jobs. Steelers running back Le'Veon Bell said that he's coming back to the team during week seven which is the Steelers' bye week, despite the Steelers shopping the star running back around. 
I'm joined at the desk by Drew Gentry and Blake Stetman to come up with possible trade deal destinations for Le'Veon Bell. So Drew, is there any way this could all pan out this season? It's going to be super hard to shop Le'Veon Bell. He's very expensive. The, the price for him is too much than teams are willing to give up. The only trade I can even think that could possibly happen is Jay Ajayi and a first round pick. A running so, back for a running back. Running back for a running back along with the first round pick. And if you're only going to get half a season of Le'Veon Bell, why give up Jay Ajayi yeah, but for I, that? Jay Ajayi just uh, got hurt and is out for the season this year. So I don't even think that's going to happen. If I just think what he's given up this year, I don't think it's going to happen. I agree with you there. Uh, I think it's going to happen after the season when he's going to try to get a new contract. I do see some particular fits that would work for him. However, this season, the way it's rolling, I just really don't see him getting traded. Uh, and with the Steelers organization, he needs to get out of there as soon as possible. They're, they're they are blowing a, up. Oh, everything that's happened this year, it's just caused a huge <laughs> mess. What the, do you guys think the dynamic could be like if uh, – if they do bring Le'Veon back, but they want to do a dual running back system with him and James Conner, do you think that could work? Yeah, I, I don't think that'll work. I don't think that's possible. I think it's the Le'Veon Bell show. I, Le'Veon Bell needs to be the star of the show. Wherever he wants to go, he wants to be number one option out of the backfield. And he would still, no matter what, we're seeing more dominant running backs. The running game is becoming up and up in these past couple of years, oh, yeah. especially with the running backs like Sony Mitchell. And then we have Todd Gurley, who's taken the league by storm. And we just have all these running backs that hit his trade value is so high for the Steelers organization. The only way they could get something done is if they sign and trade, and then they get a, an elite running Absolutely. back for and a first running or yeah. first round. Well, I, I next year, where could you see him going? You know, free agency. Could they trade him? Where, where do you see him going? So I do see a few fits personally. I said the Colts. I think the Colts. I think Chris Ballard, the general manager of the Indianapolis Colts, I think he's willing to take a risk. Uh, Marlon Mack, their starting running back, has been hurt all year or so far this season. I just think they need a little boost. I think having him in the backfield would really help, um, you know, mix up the, de the defense and give uh, Andrew Luck a little more time than what they do have. I think that he might actually end up back with the Steelers. I don't really want that to happen. But, but why would he give up all that money this season? And back to the question before, like splitting time, he gave up so <laughs> much money this season. Be, yeah, he came wants to be out and said he wants to be a Steeler for his life. He's come out and said that before the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this trade rumors came out, but he's still, the reason he's coming back to the team is because he wants to be a part of the Steelers organization and show them I'm worth this money this offseason. If you don't pay me, I'm not afraid not to show back up. I just up. don't see it happening, though. And Antonio Brown, he's been complaining. Everyone's complaining in Pittsburgh but right I now. I think complaining about Pittsburgh is because Le'Veon Bell is not there. Oh, that definitely is, that because definitely he is a part is of the it, vocal yeah. point of that entire offense. One team I think would be absolutely ecstatic to have him, and they have the payroll. He could honestly end up going into the division if he went to the Browns. That would be I like the Browns. Like I do like the Baker, Browns. Baker Mayfield, him, yeah. Jarvis Landry. That offense would be so star-studded, and they would have that explosive player they need, and have the backup in Carlos Hyde who can give them down along with Duke Johnson. Oh yeah, it's that, a great, that's a great team. And the last uh, spread them out. And they've been really focusing on defense in the draft uh, the past two mm -hmm. years, a little low key. Miles Garrett a couple of years ago, and then Denzel Ward, who's been a star this year. They did break down a little last two game. Five, two out of their top five, or two out of their three top five picks have been defensive. It's a very want, exciting team. They don't yeah. understand. Could you that. imagine an AFC North with Baker, Mayfield, Jarvis Landry, all those players you said just on the same team? Oh, they could wreck they take right. over. And I think the and Browns, Browns culture would yeah. be completely back. They're one step away from being an elite team. They've proven that they can get into those games where they compete. It's just now they need to learn to finish, and they're starting to learn. If they added a dominant player like Le'Veon Bell. The Browns would be absolutely amazing. A lot of options on the table for Le'Veon Bell this offseason, but that's all the time we have for this block. When we come back, Matt will be discussing the biggest upset of UFC, uh, FCS history and what the playoff structure might look like. On Saturday, Elon University delivered one of the biggest upsets in college football history when they went to JMU and knocked off the Dukes, who were favored by almost 40 points. I'm joining the desk by David Flint to discuss what this means for the FCS top 10 rankings and the playoffs. And if the season ended today, we're going to talk about it all, David. So, Elon, with the huge upset, we'd love to see it. If the season ended today, what do the FCS playoffs look like for you? One half of the bracket unquestionably runs through the Fargo Dome at North Dakota State. They are one of four undefeated FCS teams still left. Two of those are in the Ivy League who don't play in postseason. One is Colgate, who plays in the terrible Patriot League. So... North Dakota State, if they went out, they're the top seed without question, I think. But 
I would say right now that Elon's deserving of the two. Yes, they're ranked behind Eastern Washington and Kennesaw State, but the strength of schedule in the Big South where Kennesaw State is is awful. Then only a couple of good teams in the Big Sky. You've got Weber State, you've got Montana who's so-so, but other than that, really nothing there for Eastern Washington. The strength of schedule in the CAA though, brutal. Maine, Rhode Island, JMU, who is still a very elite team despite losing. You can't get better than that except maybe in the Missouri Valley where, where North Dakota State is. Exactly, so, yeah. That was a big one for well, and we know that. Let's move down the road. So we have their upcoming schedule. Can they win the CAA overall? Can they win the regular season championship? I think they can. Their best chance right now to win the CAA, obviously, is to win out. They don't have any conference losses yet. And the biggest test, I'd argue, is already passed, JMU. The biggest test coming, though, Tom Flacco and the Towson Tigers. Does that last name sound familiar? It should. That's Joe's younger brother. If he's anything like his brother, he can throw dimes everywhere. And their offense put up 52 points on a ranked Stony Brook team. So there's no slouch there. But the big thing for Elon is they lost that conference game against William and Mary due to Florence. So they basically have to win out and play the percentages game. Otherwise, if JMU only comes in with one loss or Maine or Rhode Island may only come in with one as well, Towson also, you don't want to fall into the trap of having to play the percentages when you have one fewer game. All right, so Elon, have a chance. We'll be hoping for him. Roll Phoenix, right? Sounds like Tom Flacco's offense is a bit better than the Ravens' offense. Maybe you should take some, <laughs> some tips there from Tom Flacco. That's all the time we have left, but don't go anywhere. Next up, we'll be discussing all the chaos that occurred this past weekend in the UFC. <laughs> I'm one on Monkey Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning 1 in 750,000. Please fasten your seat belts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. Donations to Goodwill fund job training programs right in your community. Feels good to start fresh, right? Sure does. And like that, you're a job creator. Wow. What a night. UFC 229 was last Saturday, and like many others, I'm speechless about what happened in one of the craziest nights in MMA history. Luckily, I'm here with Emmanuel Tobe to talk about what just happened. So, Manny, 
Khabib Nurmagomedov, look, great in his first title defense. Against Conor McGregor, nevertheless, who could possibly dethrone him? Honestly, I was looking at the light, I was looking at the lightweight division, and I don't see a lot of options. I mean, Khabib is just such a monster. I mean, he's good, he's a good standing fighter, but really, he's one of the best, like, control, ground control fighters I've seen in my life. I mean, compared to so someone great. who, like, is expert at boxing as Conor McGregor is. He kept him on the ground the entire time, never really got much offense in at mm -hmm. all. So what, what, happened, what needs to happen in order for someone to beat Khabib is they have to be a great boxer, kind of like how McGregor was, but their, standing, but their standing defense needs to be impressive. Like, they have to be able to stay, they have to be able to keep standing and to not be taken down. And I think the only person that can do that right now is Tony Ferguson, who's coming off a really great bout against Anthony Pettis at the same UFC 229. And if you look at how he competed and how great he was, I mean, he landed a total of 115 strikes, and 114 of those were significant strikes. He landed all of those strikes in the first two, in two rounds. He's great, he's, a great on, he's great standing up, but also let's talk about his defense. He has a 77% takedown defense percentage in his career, and he managed to make Kevin Lee tap out, who has eight submission victories in his UFC career. I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at Tony Ferguson, I think if anyone can stop Khabib, and I don't think there's a lot of people, I, was I think say, it's Ferguson. I if he wrestled Bears as a kid, it's going to be hard to dethrone him, especially when he's on a roll like this. But, of course, we have to talk about the post-match brawl that erupted after Khabib jumped over the guardrail, attacked Connor's trainers. What does this incident do for the legacy of this match, as well as its competitors? I mean, you, first, you completely forget there's a match. I mean, what match, to be honest? Afterwards, after the brawl and everything, no one was talking about the match. No one was talking about these two competitors and, re and the respect and stuff like that. Everyone was just talking about the post-match brawl. And to me, all it does is just make you forget about the match and just, it's just a huge blimage on UFC. You ever thought about what they wanted to do. if it could have been scripted? Could have been, <laughs> you know, a little no, shaded I, WWE in it's there? It's definitely all? not scripted. But I think what we will see, I think this will definitely have a huge impact on UFC as a sport going forward. I think we have to watch how UFC punishes Khabib. And I think if they choose not to punish him, just give him a slap on the wrist and stuff like that, then we'll see them go towards, uh, I won't say scripted, but go towards, you know, these choreographed post-match exactly. antics, the trash talk and things like that. And it'll be great for the sport because it'll give them a lot of revenue. But I think you, if you're talking about like the legacy and if you're talking about, you know, the respect that, you know, people have for the sport of UFC and for MMA as a whole, I think it'll definitely diminish. They that. already said that, um, they could have had McGregor press charges, chose not to. They didn't award um, Khabib the belt after the match because of that. They just declared him the winner. What does this mean for Conor next? For how, does, how does McGregor recover after this? Well, I think McGregor, for one, has to... He, he's been calling, he's been wanting a rematch of Khabib. Uh, he's definitely, he should not get a rematch. Uh, I think he has to go back down the ladder a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, Tony Ferguson, uh, he's now the, the number one contender for the lightweight after beating Anthony Pettis. So I think for McGregor, I think he goes down the ladder. Uh, I think he has a couple more matches. And if he wants to try to come back and challenge Khabib in the future, he can. But I think uh, right now, McGregor just slides down the ladder in terms of who's going to take on Khabib next. I mean, McGregor said good knock, looking for the rematch, and so are we. That's all the time we have for now. When we return, I'll be joined by Matt to talk about one of the most entertaining athletes in the NFL, Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey has gone scorched earth on the entire NFL. From stars like Elon Manning to Tyreek Hill, even his grandma isn't safe from his roast. With that in mind, Andrew, what has been your favorite Jalen Ramsey slam this year? I know this one has hit home close to me, but... The Joe Flacco disc, disc, obviously everyone coming out making fun of how he's elite or lack of his eliteness rather, but he took it one step further. He went on his GQ interview and said, he sucks. I faced him twice and he's trash. He said, Lamar Jackson should have started immediately over him. No idea why he isn't and just cold blooded and straight to the point. Yeah, that may have been an overreaction. I like Josh Allen. He said, I think Allen is trash. I don't care what anybody says he's trash. It's going to show he's a stupid draft pick. He said, 
I'm excited to play them. I love that he's their starting quarterback. I, to that, to me, when a quarterback says he's excited to play you, that's offensive as a starting quarterback because he doesn't believe in you. But I'll, oh, he's getting ready Josh to Allen. feast. Yeah. Exactly. But I just think Jalen Ramsey is becoming the new Terrell Owens in terms of trash talk in the NFL. This feels like what Josh Norman did like two years ago yeah, before, before he yeah, fell off. You know, before he went to the Redskins. That's beside the point. <laughs> but Jalen Ramsey, great player as we mentioned, got torched by Tyree Kill. So maybe he's eating his words a little bit now. Jalen Ramsey is not good enough to be doing this. He's he's a you good. So. He's a good cornerback. He's not the best cornerback. He's not good enough to say they're all trash. I'm the best. We saw it with Tyreek Hill. We saw it with Odell Beckham. He's not as good as he says. Get he the is. popcorn out because I'm sure many more. He's entertaining though. He's entertaining. Absolutely. That's for sure. That's all the time we have for this episode of One on One Sports. A huge shout out goes out to all of our producers, crew, talent, and you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you liked what you saw and want to see more, be sure to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, all at One on One Sports. Until next time, whose side are you on? Uh -huh.